can't hear Jayanti. No, uh, Dr. Ravi, you're still on mute. No. I think you have to log out and log in. So Param, shall we uh, shall we get started in the meantime? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Is it? Uh, am I audible now? Yes. yes perfect. Thank you. <laughs> thank How you. Are you in your new chair? Hi, Jayanti. Hi, sir. It's such a pleasure to see you. Great to see you. Where are you? So I am, as you can see, at the foot of the mother and Sri Aurobindo. Uh, I have been posted as secretary at the Oroville Foundation which is in Oroville. It's, a, it's an international uh, universal city with people from about 60 countries. So we have the 150th year celebrations of Sri Aurobindo coming. It's a central deputation. So I've been appointed here about- Wow, a week ago. fantastic. Uh, Great. In fact, uh, many of the people here have done some fantastic work on water sanitation as well. So just, just uh, an input. Can, can we slightly raise that so that you see the picture completely in the backdrop? Little, little bit. All that's right. Little. Yeah, no, that's, that's. Okay, thank you everyone once again for joining us this evening. And um, I would like to begin by welcoming the speaker and the panelists for today's event. So good evening and uh, welcome the speaker, the panelists and all the participants who have made time today evening. And of course, you know, like every event now, we hope that you're all doing well and are keeping safe. And in light of what's happening around us, I think today's talk uh, has even more significance uh, given Param's work in uh, you know, in leading the Swachh Bharat mission, so I'll get that uh, get to that in just a bit. Um, where we had planned this event back in April, but at that time no one knew what was going to hit us, and the second wave uh, hit all of us very hard. And uh, we are glad that you know in this digitally connected world we could uh, still go ahead and have the event in a virtual format. Uh, so you know. To, to now introduce our speaker, Mr. Parmeshwar and Ayer. Uh, Param is currently the global lead for strategic initiatives in the World Bank's water global practice. And before that, he served in the government of India, the Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation, uh, where his role was to lead the implementation of the Swachh Bharat mission. And he is uh, formerly the secretary to the government of India for drinking water and sanitation. And in his uh, memoir, Method in the Madness, uh, he shares his fascinating professional journey, you know, being an IS officer in the 1980s and working inside the government for about 20 years and then going outside, joining the World Bank, uh, taking a break in between uh, to be the manager and coach for his daughter who professionally plays tennis and there was this interesting conversation as we just started uh, the event on what's happening uh, of course in the Wimbledon and then back in 2016 he uh, worked with the government where he was as I mentioned the lead for the Swachh Bharat mission and that's why he calls himself the insider outsider insider and that's what we are going to hear from him today uh, which is a story uh, with a lot of unique insights and full of inspiration and a lot of humor and some practical uh, public management lessons which is what uh, a lot of us are here today to hear about and joining him are two very eminent panelists uh, Dr. Jayanti Ravi and Dr. Lakshmi Bhavani uh, Dr. Ravi is, uh, you know, she calls herself a scientist, uh, she's a civil servant, uh, she's also a trained vocalist, um, and she is a you know, widely traveled development practitioner. And she has herself 
uh, authored books, including a book called Sanity and Sanitation. So both our speaker, uh, Param, as well as Dr. Ravi, have something in common, which is uh, you know, writing about sanitation. And therefore, we believe they will have uh, a really interesting dialogue here. And uh, Dr. Ravi, uh, she got her MPA from Howard and then uh, also has a PhD. Um, from uh, MSU in Baroda. So she was, uh, until very recently, the secretary for, principal secretary for the Health and Family Welfare Department for the state of Gujarat and has moved now uh, to the Oroville Foundation. Um, and with her, we have Dr. Lakshmi Bhavani, who is the chief of UNICEF Gujarat. And she is responsible for coordinating and managing uh, programs related to children's and women's rights. And both uh, Dr. Ravi as well as uh, Dr. Bhavani have worked you know, extensively during these COVID times and also previously in all kinds of uh, emergencies, you know, tsunamis, cyclones. Uh, so both of them have experienced uh, and handled disasters and are you know, they have a lot of perspective on disaster management themselves. Um, Dr. Bhavani uh, has also you know, extended support to UNICEF officers in South Africa and Nigeria. Uh, so with us, you know, we have this uh, eminent panel and, of course, uh, our speaker. And we are looking forward to an exciting and insightful discussion. So over to you, Param, uh, now without any further ado. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Namrata. And good evening to all of you. Great to see Jayanti again, and uh, glad to have Lakshmi on the panel. Let me also at the outset say it's fantastic to reconnect with my former IAS batchmate and very close friend, Abhay Borwankar, who's also an IMA alum. And as Namrata said, we were just exchanging notes on the, on the Wimbledon final uh, yesterday. Uh, we were sort of opposite ends of being supporters. So we were just catching up on that, but it's really nice to be here today. And I also have to say that, you know, Jayanti, when she was secretary in charge of sanitation and rural development in Gujarat, reached out to me even before I came back in my second stint as an insider. So I was in Washington. I had been appointed the secretary in the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation. And I got an email from Jayanti saying, uh, you know, inviting me to Gujarat and to come and visit and to have a discussion with the government on how they could accelerate the, the Swaj Bharat mission. So my first trip outside, so I joined on the 1st of March and I think within a few days I was in Gandhinagar and uh, meeting with Jayanti, seeing already the excellent work which she had initiated. Met the chief minister, went to the sanitation park uh, with Jayanti. So it was a fascinating introduction to sanitation in India. And of course, Jayanti did a fantastic job in you know, converting Gujarat to open defecation free status. So glad to be again with all of you. So let me just say a couple of words because uh, I'm hoping that we have a good discussion. We've got these two very eminent panelists uh, with Namrata moderating and hopefully we get some questions from the audience as well. Uh, you know, not much to add to what Namrata said, but uh, for me, this book was about, you know, I wanted to share my experiences in government, outside government, and also to sort of share some of those, put those experiences into pro tips, which kind of run through the book in terms of practical insights and everything I learned through my 35, 40 year journey inside and outside. And I thought for an audience like uh, at IIMA, it might be interesting in terms of both of public policy, but also in terms of being practitioners. And in a sense, how do you sort of manage large transformational programs? What are the challenges? What are the difficulties? How do you set about it? And how can you learn from this and apply some of these lessons to other programs? And also in any sphere in which any one of us works, I mean, all of you are, you know, we have students, we have alumni, we have staff, and uh, how can these sort of be related to your own context? So that was the broad purpose. I was lucky in a sense, when the lockdown started in, uh, in what, end of March 20, uh, you know, my travel suddenly stopped. I used to travel a lot as part of my job. 
And when that travel stopped, you know, it was an opportunity to sort of sit down and think about what, you know, experiences of working inside the government, outside the government and coming back. So I managed to sort of within about six months come out with a, a, a first cut of the manuscript. So it was a great opportunity. I kind of seized the moment. It's one of the pro tips in my book, Carpe Diem, and uh, managed to get the book out. But uh, again, uh, you know, thanks to my wife who was the one who pushed me into this and sort of steered the ship, family ship during these last 30, 40 years, uh, you know, managed to get it out. So let me stop there. Uh, it will be great to get the views of Jayanti and Lakshmi and Namrata, and then hopefully we can open it up. Back to you, Namrata. Thank you, Param. Um, I will start with uh, Dr. Ravi and then go to Dr. Bhavani. Dr. Ravi, uh, you know, please, uh, you know, you, could, you can take the stage now. Um, I think it was absolutely fashions from your book, uh, uh, sir. It, it really summed up the manner in which, uh, you know, you had to straddle with so many stakeholders, often each of them having a different conflicting uh, 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 you, you know, uh, they, they may, their interests and their objectives may be different, given that uh, we're working in a very heterogeneous setup. And, and also what one really liked was the way you straddled both your personal and professional journeys and straddling the inside, outside, inside aspects. So there were uh, a few questions also that I wanted to ask. One of the uh, statements or similes that you would often use is that uh, we need to paint the flight as it is in motion. Okay. Am I audible now? I thought I was muted for a while. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So wanted to know, A, when it comes to painting the flight in motion and, and when you have to paint a flight which is headed in a direction, but there are all kinds of eddies and cross eddies and there's a tailwind and there's a headwind. How did you manage to negotiate all of it and yet did such a spectacular job of steering the country? Of course, it was the vision of the Honorable Prime Minister because for someone to have a dream that at that point of time may have seemed absolutely foolhardy to say to go and proclaim uh, from the top of the red fort that I want to see an open defecation free India uh, would really have meant taking his neck out. But then uh, to, to really carry that through with a set of actions and also uh, the fact that this entire campaign, the, 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 the magnitude of work, the, the amount of money that was spent, it's very often in the past you had a series of uh, assets getting built, toilets getting built, uh, with, which would not be used. So it would also lead into a multi, multi crore audit trail and so on. You know, so it was fraught with so many uh, uncertainties, difficulties and different uh, cross currents. So how did you negotiate that? And particularly in the context of pro tips for the generation next that is watching this uh, young MBA students. Uh, and many of them may also be aspirants for a career which is absolutely exciting in the civil services. So wanted to hear you on that, uh, sir. No, uh, thanks, Jayanti. <clears throat> you know, spot on in terms of uh, the challenges. Thank you for asking that question. And, you know, for the younger generation, for those who might be joining this discussion, I have to say, since my good friend Abhay Borwankar is also joining and batchmate, you know, we were together on, a, uh, on our army attachment. We had gone to Kargil and, uh, in 1980, 1983. And even at that time, in the kind of arrogance of uh, being young IAS officers, we got into a big discussion with our army officer counterparts and, you know, very arrogantly proclaimed that this is the best job in the world. <laughs> I'll be able to remember that. And I have to say it is, you know, I, if looking back, it's an incredible opportunity to actually achieve impact on the ground at scale. But as you said, in terms of the you know, these incredible challenges and cross currents which face all of us in our careers, you know, public or private. I think there were three or four factors which stood out to our advantage. Uh, you know, in, in some ways we call them the four Ps. We were very lucky, as you mentioned, Jayanti, that the Prime Minister of India, you know, proclaimed uh, his sort of intentions objective very boldly, he took a big risk in saying that, you know, India would become open defecation free in just five years. 
that level of political leadership, it was too good an opportunity to let go. And so I still remember, and it's in the book, how my wife and I were watching this on television in Vietnam when I was in the World Bank there. And I was blown away that the prime minister is talking about toilets and the indignity of women and girls from the Red Fort. And with that level of political leadership, and then the second P, so you know, we spoke about the four Ps, political leadership, public financing. You mentioned putting, investing in this. So the government of India and the state governments, you know, you were implementing this in Gujarat. They invested in sanitation. I see around the world, even if you get political leadership, investing for a finance minister of a country with scarce resources to decide to invest in sanitation, which actually has, as many studies have shown, a five is to one return in terms of health, in terms of economics, in terms of jobs, environment. So the government put its money where its mouth was. So we needed to ride that wave. And so one of the pro tips is, you know, cut, you've got to seize the moment. And I think in any sphere of life, in any job, there are moments which you need to sort of seize and sort of take full advantage of. And that was one of our, it was the wind at our back. But beyond that, you know, once the prime minister set out his vision, it was up to us in the ministry working together with you guys in the States and all the way down to the districts is to convert that vision into a reality. So in many situations, public, private, as all of us know, the leader will set out a vision. And then, you know, somebody else needs to convert that vision into reality. And in the beginning, even in the ministry, for me, it was fantastic, Jayanti, that I could come and meet you within a week in Gujarat because you were clearly a believer, right? You were a believer and you motivated and inspired your team in Gujarat to get the job done. But in my own ministry at that time, there were a couple of people who were conventional civil servants who said, listen, sanitation is a state subject. So how is it our responsibility in the government of India? You know, we can provide technical assistance, we can give some money, but ultimately it's the state government's responsibility to deliver. And so uh, we don't want to be, so we had to make people believers. And I've got a little, uh, you know, I wrote a little piece in the Indian Express a couple of years ago called the A, B, C, D, E of implementation. So you have to align A, you have to believe, you know, you've got to have a team of believers. You have to believe the job can be done. You have to communicate. And it was important to communicate, uh, you know, to spread the word that this thing is working. You have D is democratize, bring it down to the grassroots, get the village community involved. And it's important to evaluate E because you need external evaluation for the integrity of the program. And then you need to follow through to make sure that whatever you achieve is sustainable. So I think, you know, we tried to do that, uh, but essentially it was teamwork. It was working with the state governments. You guys were leading it with districts, motivating, communicating, and actually doing a lot of traveling. So I think those were some of the ingredients. There were a lot of challenges. There were political issues. Uh, how do you change behavior? How do you sustain it? Many challenges, but overall it was good fun. And uh, working with the states and the uh, leaders such as yourself, I think made a big difference. Thank you, Param, for your responses. Uh, Dr. Ravi, did you have any quick follow-ups on that before I go to uh, Dr. Bhavani? You're not audible, Dr. Ravi. Am I audible now, Namrata? Yes, you are. Yes, okay. I thought uh, he mentioned the four Ps uh, and the fifth P, which is his name probably, but the, I, I heard two Ps, <laughs> political leadership, public financing. I'm not sure I heard the other two, so thought maybe if he wanted to. <laughs> sure. Thanks for reminding me. So the third P was partnerships, right? With organizations such as UNICEF, you have Lakshmi here, or NGOs, the media, the private sector. We had the Tata Trust giving us, if you remember, Jayanti, the young professionals, we had 500 of them, one per district. So, uh, and of course, the fourth P was people's participation. In the end, you know, this had to become a Jan Andolan. If it had to succeed, people had to be proud of the program, they had to own it, then they had to take the lead themselves. And I think, let me just finally say, although it's not a P, W, women, I think women 
played a huge role in this program at all levels. Whether it was Rani Misri's or the school girls who said, Mujhe shochale chahiye, or leaders such as yourself. Remember our minister was a woman. Some of our best collectors, our champion collectors were women. And I think they were, so they you know, went from becoming beneficiaries at the village level to becoming leaders. So I think those were some of the factors which led to the success of the program. Thank you. I'll, I'll probably come back after Lakshmi uh, Namita, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, over to you, Dr. Bhavani. Uh, thank you, uh, Namita. And good evening, all. Uh, in fact, I'm deeply honored and privileged to be with the distinguished gathering here today as one of the panelists. And at the outset, I would like to congratulate uh, Ms. Raya for the strategic and sustainable results-based community-led and community-owned mission which he has started to enable the clean environment in India. But at the same time, he has really focused on how to promote the dignity and privacy of the people, especially women and girls in the country. And I also take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to JSW School of Public Policy, IAM Ahmedabad, for a very engaging and productive knowledge management event today. I consider this is a real knowledge giving and knowledge sharing. And I'm privileged to have been associated with the government of Gujarat, wherein the government under the leadership of Dr. Jayanti Ravi led a very successful people's campaign during this SBM phase one, which has provided 3.3 million household toilets. She is not only the driver, but she is the practitioner. And it resulted in the state scale up ODF declaration on 2nd October, 2017. And during this time, it was so heartening to see active engagement of the PRIs, youth networks, women SHGs, and many other volunteers besides the district administrations. I have personally witnessed whenever we go to the villages, we see the women doing the policing. And they were so active and they were so proud to do that. And uh, I also see that teams from several countries visited during this period. They visited India to study and learn from this model. And uh, during my assignment in Nigeria, I had the opportunity to visit few governors and permanent secretaries. And I used to feel so proud when every one of them referred to India and also the Swachh Bharat mission in particular. So, and I also take uh, this opportunity to express our sincere appreciations to Mr. Iyer for authoring this book, Methods and Madness, which has depicted wonderful insights. It has brought multiple perspectives very inspiring for youth, especially those who do not carry a definite vision since the childhood. He has narrated so well. And this narration gives the youth the direction and confidence how they can shape their future productively. And the book also helps young generations to widen their knowledge base, gives them some development tips, pro tips, which, we, which have been referred several times. And some of them just I would like to quote the power of being well-read, the yields of trying to be creative and unconventional methods at times, which helps in developing determination, resilience, perseverance, and in one word, the holistic personality development. Sir, you have been a multifaceted personality and one has a lot to learn from you. Personally, I have really been benefited by reading this book because I, it tells us how to run a results-based mission. What is the power of people's connect and ownership? And many more. And each pro tip given in this book highlighted in the box item is a learning in itself. For instance, you have said, no such thing that mission accomplished. If you have achieved something, you should get ready for the new. I fully believe in that. Because if once we feel that we are accomplished, we have accomplished something, that is the end of our development. And your achievement as an insider, outsider, and insider, it really tells us we can do if we have the determination and the will, no matter where we are and what we are. So while I was going through this whole SBM implementation and also this book, it has really stirred some thoughts in me and my curiosity to deep dive into the book and know from you. And today I am fortunate to be here and I got an opportunity to directly interact with you. And you are the author and architect of this book. So we would like to hear from you. So with your permission, I would like to put forth some questions to you. 
so that we will be and everyone who is here today will be benefited to uh, hear you and your reflections and first thing you have already mentioned that the highest polit political commitment that we got but uh, and you have responded to it but one supplementary question to that is had there been no political commitment what would have been your strategy and how you would have achieved the same goals and objectives i'm sure you would have achieved but i just would like to hear from you my second question to you is you also mentioned about the federal structure and uh, the state subject and center sub central subjects and all and you did mention about couple of resistances from the people but the, the our country is such a vast country so how you could bring all the states and all the district administrations and you have directly dealt with the district administrations so how you could bring everybody on one platform because the results are enormous and they are sustainable results so i would like to hear from you and my third question the use of toilet demands a huge behavior change sustainable behavior change with the deeply embedded social norms and several heterogeneous ethnicities and cultures being involved how could you crack this and how could you ensure that behavior change in such a short time and my last question to you is and today it is so heartening that sanitation and toilets is everyone's business it involves every department every partner every stakeholder it has become a development and diverse agenda so representing a minuscule and newly emerged ministry in government of india how could you harmonize and bring all the major ministries on one table wide range of stakeholders are one table one platform and make svm as everybody's business so i am like very very curious and look forward to hear you and learn from you further sir thank you thanks a lot uh, lakshmi you know you actually bold several googlies at me they wait up questions <laughs> <laughs> but i'm i'm going to try and respond in a sense some of, you know they're all related so so maybe i'll you know i'll have a crack at it you know your first question is is very relevant particularly for me now working globally on water and sanitation across the world so what if we did not have that level of political support which is the case in most countries to be honest when i was working in the world bank in vietnam the word defecation was a bad word you know it was not uh, to be used in polite society the prime minister of vietnam we were trying to get them hard to take up a national sanitation program and you know he shied away from that term itself so it was not just refreshing but incredible to have prime minister modi talking about toilets from the red fort and so so we were so we were very lucky and as one of the pro tips said look you've got to seize the moment right you have an opportunity which suddenly springs up and you grab it with both hands but if it's not there which is the case now you know and in fact you spoke about nigeria very glad to hear you worked there because minister suleiman adu came to india for that convention and of course uh, janti showed them around gujarat the, all the sanitation ministers and they were inspired by by india but still he told me he wasn't getting that level of political support from the president of nigeria and we see that in many countries so i think some of the lessons which i learned are linked to your second question working in a federal context you know where you have intergovernmental relationship between the federal the state the district and local is always very very challenging and i think you have got to build a coalition and you have really got to build support from below your second question you know was in a country as large as india how do you sort of get people together how do you work across states and how do you work at different levels i think that's one of the reasons why we were you know we achieved some success which was to work at different levels so for example coming to gandhinagar meeting the chief minister meeting jayanti understanding the complexities and challenges of the state government but very very importantly needing to understand what's happening at the district level because in the end it's a district collector or the deputy commissioner who is integrating different programs and focusing on a particular area so it is important to motivate the young collectors to get them excited about the program to recognize their achievements to share the lessons with others and then going one level below 
which was why you know i had to become a traveling salesman in many in many ways me and my team we just traveled across india so i think one of the uh, reasons why you know we could get traction in the states and in the districts was reaching out to the states understanding their problems encouraging a friendly competition and i think most of all motivating and getting the young ias officers and people on the ground excited about the program and wanting to participate and i think bringing in multiple departments and actors into it the sarpanchs the anganwadi workers the asha workers i mean you know jayanti can tell you how she did it in a state because you know we were at one level above but we were engaged with states and we encouraged cross learning as well so part of the agenda was to organize frequent learning events across states getting collectors to share their experiences with others so when i joined there were about 15 or 16 districts which were already odf right open defecation free and these were in the kind of expected the usual suspects sikkim kerala uh, you know himachal pradesh haryana and gujarat was obviously above average but it still had a long way to go so how did we get, build on early successes so we set sort of milestones for ourselves you know let's achieve this let's go for the low hanging fruit let's show that it's possible and then we get the collectors to tell other collectors how it was done and we got some of the lagging states lagging districts we paired them with some of the champion collectors so all that was part of our job as kind of being motivators uh, knowledge people sharing experiences and so i think that was one of the ways in which we address the huge sort of diversity and scale of india because remember we had big challenges scale speed uh, we had to deal with stigma and we had to deal with sustainability so i think our role was a role of a facilitator a communicator a motivator and i think uh, that became very very important in the context of a large country like india and the issue of behavior change it was really at the heart of the program right uh, i still remember that old ad by the tata steel group uh, we do a num- we also make steel and in many ways you know we we like to say we also made toilets now the fact that more than 100 million toilets were constructed uh, you know more than 10 crore toilets were built uh, that was secondary the main thing was how do you change behavior how do you get people to stop defecating in the open and we learned a lot of things and you know if you want to use the fancy behavioral economics terms we did a lot of nudge at scale because we found out that changing behavior you know we learned from the experiences both of india and abroad uh, that it's not people do not necessarily respond to kind of top down messaging which traditional uh, you know messaging had taken place in government use a toilet it's good for you it's good for health we found out that kind of more non rational uh, triggers of behavior change were more effective so whether it was disgust or love or pride as you know in up they started calling their toilets izzat ghar so it is important to get that community as a whole to understand the importance of the usage of toilets from many perspectives but that trigger could have could be it could have been emotion it could have been love like toilet ek prem katha many of you would have seen that movie uh, it could be you know just pride in having a toilet uh, particularly for women and girls it could be disgust that i can't believe even if i have a neighbor i didn't know that my neighbor who doesn't have a toilet they are defecating in the open and they are spreading infection and the flies which are sitting on that excreta are coming and sitting on my chapati so all that awareness we needed to trigger behavior change and it had to be done in different contexts differently as you asked so while the framework was the same there was a different kind of triggering going on in champaran and bihar uh, and a different kind of triggering going on in narmada district in gujarat etc but i think the principles were the same we had village motivators swachagrahis who were trained in community approaches to sanitation and they adapted it to their own particular context and having the young professionals one per district almost given to us by the tata group that made a huge difference they were young enthusiastic creative and they were the eyes and ears of the collectors so i think this combination of the multiple factors made a difference and then finally to your last point 
how sanitation was important to become everyone's business. So in the government of India, it was not enough to deal vertically with states, but it was important to deal horizontally in GOI, to get finance ministry, railways, health, education, to get them all on board. So we worked with schools to get school kids, the best ambassadors, particularly school girls on board. The railways set themselves a target of you know, having bio toilets to themselves become open defecation free. We had rural development focusing on solid waste management. So I think it was important also to make sure that, and we had the Swachata Pakhwadas for a fortnight, every ministry was considered to be the implementing ministry for Swaj Bharat, where they would mainstream sanitation into their own programs. So a number of ways in which we tried to sort of make sanitation everyone's business, both at the GOI level, but also obviously focusing on behavior change at the heart of the program and communication became essential to the whole thing both technical behavior change communication in terms of how you trigger behavior change, but also communicating with all the key stakeholders. So I had to keep all the, I just call them village elders in my book, whether it was the PMO or the cabinet secretary uh, or the minister, key people, Niti Aayog in GOI. And, you know, Jayanti would do the same in the state. You know, the finance secretary would not release her funds. So she had to go and convince them that this program was working uh, she had to go and work with the chief minister and she can tell you how she had to build a coalition of a, a team to get the whole thing done. Thank you so much, sir. It was so enlightening. <laughs>
that traditionally Navrata, as you know, you know, the classic Weberian bureaucracy is supposed to be faceless, right? And so there are many, uh, you know, I think anonymity is good. And, you know, civil servants are supposed to work selflessly. And, you know, they advise their ministers, they deliver on the ground. But I think the, there is a need now to tell some of those stories to inspire others because it leads to effect, effective communication makes a difference. And here, I think we are not talking about promoting oneself, but it's important for the program to be, if the program is successful, uh, it needs to inspire confidence in others to take it up. And therefore, it was important to celebrate the outstanding work of state governments, of collectors, of sarpanchas. So that would inspire others. Because when you're doing a program at scale, and you know, if you really want to do something at scale, I don't think there's any alternative in the social sector to government leading it, right? But they don't have to implement it, they can facilitate, they can lead. But scale can only be done when the government takes on a challenge. And in that context, it was important to communicate the successes of the districts and the states to one another. But in answer to your second question, so again, there is a political environment and all of us have to deal with it in government. And sometimes you don't have full, uh, you know, a term I learned from another, uh, I am alum, another batchmate called Deepti will have goal congruence. And I, I didn't know what it meant for a long time, but sometimes you don't have full congruence between the individual and the organization goal, right? So there, uh, and then you have, a, in some cases, a tough political environment. And again, that makes it even more challenging to be innovative and creative because risk taking, sometimes you, know, end, you end up in trouble. But if you have a, a level of political support, it gives you that confidence. So I think in an environment where the enabling setup is positive, you have to take full advantage of that. And uh, maybe many more of these stories need to be told. And as you said, it shouldn't need a book to talk about it. But I can tell you, and I'm sure Jayanti can tell you, and Abhay can tell you, and, and many people can tell you, there are many, many stories of innovation, leadership. It's happening all the time on the ground. But I think in many cases, most civil servants just don't have the time to write about it, right? They're just doing stuff. And so it's always, I had a bit of time to reflect upon it and write, but I think it's happening all over the place. And maybe they need to be teased out more. And perhaps they'll inspire some of your students in the public policy domain, because it's a fascinating area. And I think it's untapped. But maybe Jayanti has got some views, and I'd certainly love to hear from Abhay. Thank you, Param. Thank you. And I completely agree that you know, more, uh, more public entrepreneurs uh, need to be celebrated. I think that's the word. Uh, that's the catchphrase here. They need to be celebrated. It's not about you know, bragging, but really to inspire others who are in the service and others to join the services. Um, and that, I think, is missing. Uh, so much of that is missing in the, in the policy literature. Uh, I would like to call upon you know, both our panelists again to respond to this, as well as... Uh, um, Abhay, if you're if you're still online, uh, you know, and comment on just uh, the discussion that we were having. I, I if I may uh, respond to that, uh, Namrita, I think I couldn't agree more with you and uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Paramayer in terms of saying that there is an absolute imperative need to document because a lot of times uh, people who champion such efforts and when you really make things happen. I think that's one thing we as generalists, administrators are expected to do. We're not specialists. So you may not be somebody who's into the, uh, the technicalities of toilets. You, you would have to pick that up. You may not be into the technicalities of sanitation, or you may not be an epidemiological expert, but you are called upon there to lead the whole state for whether, whether it's dealing with COVID or whether it's dealing with this. So you have to put all the constituent people, some of which may be extremely polarized, as we discussed, and, and, and also some of them who may have different uh, uh, you know, perspectives on how to make it happen. And then as Sir mentioned about this goal congruence, goal congruence and also synchronization in terms of the timelines we're talking of. Somebody may say that it took 40 years to get to this level. So we may need another 30 years, but then if you have a bold 
uh, political leadership that goes out and says you want it done in five years. So you may have a big deliberation on whether you want to do it this fast, what gets compromised, and people can't sometimes even comprehend the speed at which things may have to be delivered. And, and so sometimes there is a lot of madness in that sense, a lot of insanity that surrounds us in so many ways. But within that, how do you create a semblance of sanity, a method, and how do you take it forward? So I think I couldn't agree. And therefore, there's an imperative urgent need. And as was mentioned by uh, Param, there are a large number of uh, officers who have been struggling, battling with their little ecosystem and yet uh, getting them on board and making things happen. So I think it'll be great if people like uh, you know, even uh, management schools, those which are connected with public policy, if you can even reach out. And of course, a lot of us don't really have the bandwidth, the time, and more than that, that confidence, that belief that I can take some time out and write it. Um, and there, I think one question also that I would like to ask um, Mr. Ayer is about, uh, you know, the fact that he's also been a fitness freak. And I've seen that even when he came to Porbandar, which was possibly the, the first district uh, in, in Gujarat, and perhaps one of the first districts nationally, which went ODF, it was very special because it was on 2nd October, Mahatma Gandhi's birthplace, Swachh Bharat Mission had Gandhi's uh, glasses, Chashma, as its uh, logo, as, as the symbol. So in that context, we had that, and I remember we reached late that night, and, and yet early morning he had done his, um, I don't remember, possibly a 10 kilometer jog, and so on. So I wanted, because these are very important that, you know, it, it's not a burst of adrenaline. We're all, as you would say, we're all adrenaline junkies, but you, you also need to have a lifestyle, certain uh, things that define your life and lifestyle so that you're able to sustain it. It's, it's, it's not just about performing one day and then after that, but I think that there are many officers who through their lifetime, if you see, they have been, and, and they, that, that's the way they built. So I think, uh, and a large number of them. So I wanted to hear that. And also about the fact that his energy, motivation uh, was very infectious. And I particularly remember a bunch of young interns. And that was something I too came to learn and adopt and uh, thoroughly loved. I had at one point of time, 21 interns from IIM Ahmedabad and others working with me. And of course, we must thank uh, agencies like Tata Trusts. And many of them were from your institute. And these were young students who had graduated. They just came and I think they did a fantastic job. So wanted to also hear if there is time, how did he manage to get this team uh, of young people, keep them motivated? Because oftentimes these campaigns work very well for a two month period, six month period, but a campaign and a mission for five months can really get boring. So how do you do a combination of, you know, keeping the energy on work events, and, and again, getting back to the grind, getting, so it's, it's a combination juggling between various things to keep that uh, momentum on. So these are some questions that I had. And of course, how did uh, using all these words, because initially we used to the parliamentary, I remember even emails that I would send about shit and fecal matter, or would Google would sometimes return back saying it's indecent, but they didn't realize when I was writing my book, Sanity and Sanitation, it was full of words like turd and shit. Uh, used because you had to become a little brazen in terms of using these words, as he said, the Vietnamese ecosystem and so on. You have to use these words because uh, if, if you're very, uh, you can't trigger people and you had to use words like goo in Gujarati, you had to use these very commonly. So wanted to also ask him, he's the one who got us, uh, you know, sort of on this path with people like Shuklaji. So wanted to ask these questions to him and uh, fitness, straddling personal professional life, and uh, how, how do you, this triggering, how is it happening and keeping these young teams uh, together and sustaining a campaign for so long? We'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. I'm actually going to take uh, comments uh, from Dr. Bhavani and also uh, Mr. Abhay, if he's, uh, if he's there. And then, you know, we can go back to Param and also questions have already started to flow in. So we will get to questions from the floor as well. Yeah, I'm very much uh, on line. Yes, thank you. Firstly, my apologies to everyone because I am, you know, still working from home and I'm in my casual kurta and pajama, which I find very, very comfortable. So, but uh, my apologies. Uh, Would you be able to turn up your volume? Well, actually, I'm on full. I okay. Oh, or maybe just come closer because it's yeah. a little bit distant. That's all. Yeah. 
Okay, can you hear me better now? Better, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Jayanti, and uh, good evening to everybody. Hey, Param. Uh, it's been a long, long while before we met and spoke like this. And uh, thank you for your kind words. And may I reciprocate? Because I've never had the opportunity in all these years to um, you know, speak with you and congratulate you on the work that you did in the ministry. Uh, so let me take this opportunity and you know, express my deep, deep appreciation for what you did in, in all the years that uh, you were there in the Swachhata program. A fantastic work. Uh, you know, I, I, there, there was a question which has been bothering me for some time uh, about uh, government and the way it works and things. And uh, I'm going to, I think Jayanti mentioned uh, a part of it. Uh, and I just wanted to expand on that and seek your views, um, you know, on this. And the point that I, you know, the question that I have in mind, and there are two parts to this. The first part is there are thousands of good stories, uh, you know, going around uh, in the country yeah, from a village level to taluka level to district level to state level, everywhere. Every state has some great stories, some great programs being implemented either by the government started by the government, motivated, or by individuals themselves. And we know there are lots of stories. Since you were, uh, you know, you are involved so much with the issues of water, let me just mention a couple uh, in, in that particular domain. You, you must have all, you all heard of Anna Hazare. And you have heard of his, you know, the, the village called Raligan Shiddin uh, in uh, Ahmednagar. And I, I belong to the, uh, the state of Maharashtra. And I stay in Pune and, you know, Raligan Shiddi is not very far from here. And we all know the story behind that. You know, in 1972, there was a huge drought uh, situation. Raligan Shiddi is, is situated in an area uh, which is very arid, uh, which has, I think, if I remember correctly, memory serves me right, about six inches of rainfall uh, annually. And in 1972, there was... Uh, unbelievable drought, really bad drought there, which is when Anna Hazare started this program, you know, which led into a massive watershed development uh, program. You know, they, they, they built, they did a lot of contour bonding and, you know, the entire village, he motivated the entire village to get into a huge watershed uh, program. And the result of that is that today, you know, uh, there is no shortage of water in, in a village. Uh, which is which is in a drought prone area. That is one example. The, the number of things they did over there, you know, they changed the entire cropping pattern. They, they started growing crops which, which used less water uh, than, uh, you know, the other crops. So they did a lot of, you know, a very comprehensive program and it has succeeded. The other example, Param, I don't know if you've heard, uh, maybe I, I hope that is still going on, but a few decades ago, there is a village called Naigaon, which is also not very far from uh, Pune. And uh, there is a guy called Salunke, who started what is called a Pani Panchayat uh, in that village. You know, and, and they all got together. Um, they cooperated with each other. And they built a system. They constructed a system by which the usage of whatever water was available would be rotated amongst the various farmers growing crops in a very equitable manner. That was another great experiment and it was very successful and people are very happy in that village. The reason I am mentioning these two is, and my question, the first part of the question is, Param, you know, you, you, have, you led uh, the country at the central level, you have traveled to all the states, you have seen a lot of great schemes and I'm sure you have picked up ideas from one state and tried to implement them in another. But why does this not happen in general? Why, why are good stories in one place not being replicated in another place in this country? I know there are issues. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not at all advocating, you know, one, one size fits all kind of situation. But certainly, I know that sometimes, you know, things which have the way they happen in Maharashtra cannot happen that the same way in Bihar. But 
so there are cultural differences there are all kinds of local differences but certainly the cracks of a good story from maharashtra can be picked up and it can be you know fitted into the local culture of bihar so that these basic sound ideas can be replicated across the country but it doesn't happen so i mean my first question is that uh, why is it not systemized systematized why is there not a system where this transfer of knowledge can happen you know i have a small software company and we have this normal employee turnover uh, you know every few years and when a, a core employee who has a lot of knowledge about the company goes out if we don't have a knowledge transfer uh, you know what do you call kt you know the jargon in our industry if we don't have a knowledge transfer system he just takes the knowledge away from the from the organization and then you got to have a new guy and teach him all over again so you know why do we have to reinvent this wheel and why can't we share these good stories across the country do we need a, a new ministry called the ministry of good stories with param ayer heading that and uh, you know making sure that uh, what happened the good things that happen in gujarat also happen in tamil nadu or in nagaland so that's one question why does it not happen Uh, it happens quite frequently in the private sector but it doesn't seem to happen in the government number one number two related to this the second part of my observation is you know we we've, we've all gone through uh, the this uh, a couple of years program in the academy in, in the national academy in masuri and you know this what the first part of my question impinges on the kind of training that we impart to our probationers and newcomers into uh, into the service and of course i remember you know that wonderful time i had with you in our army attachment and i, I do remember how arrogant we were <laughs> i agree with you a lot of that arrogant has been beaten out of us i think just by the fact that we have lived life uh, for quite a long time we uh, hopefully we have become more humble now uh, but you know this whole and this teaching method in the academy this has been bothering me for a long time not only the, in the academy but all the staff colleges training centers in every state we, we have one in every state now is and I, i'm relating this to my experience because i've had the good fortune of being in iim ahmedabad and also having worked in the is uh, for a few years and i'm relating these two things that the teaching methods that are applied in i am amdavad are so powerful and i'm sure other people who are on this program who are also alumni of ima will uh, agree with me that the whole case study method you know developing when of course when i was there way back in the 70s most of the case studies used to come from harvard and you know abroad because we were still developing our own case studies the indian industry was uh, you know very nascent it hadn't developed as much as the west but now there are a lot of case studies i believe even from the indian context and that is fantastic because when you share those case studies and you analyze those case studies and those stories you realize you know what were the mistakes you realize what were the good things that were done the good decisions the bad decisions why can't we you know ias officers in india and other all india service officers i'm sure have thousands of stories with them you know as they go through life in their districts i mean i did only 10 years in the service and i can tell you at least 50 stories from the you know the two three districts that i worked in some good some bad why can't we motivate people to write stories change this entire method of imparting uh, you know the training in the academy to convert it into a much more dynamic situation i'm relating it to the first one so that these stories get cross fertilized across states across uh, you know the various departments of government and newcomers you know youngsters start learning that look i this is what i can learn from these stories and i can pick it up from tamil nadu i may be in manipur but i can pick it up from gujarat and i can still implement it over here with some changes sorry i have spoken a lot but this has been bothering me for a long time and you are just the right person to ask this because you have had a sort of pan india uh you know experience of doing this and i'm sure you have picked up many good stories from one state and tried to implement it in another uh dr bhavani uh yeah any any thoughts okay. yeah uh in fact i would really uh, compliment uh, mr ayer that 
this is such a complex problem the issue of the sanitation because it is because of the deeply embedded normative behavior for centuries and for such a behavior he could break through within months so that means it is it is a very complex problem that he has taken and he could break the silence he could make everybody talk about it and we got the results within a limited time so and rightly he has done a good thing that he has kept it in a book he penned down into a book form which will be used for generations which will be a, uh, a, a learning for generations and i think already many management institutions has put this as one of the uh, topics to be uh, discussed because it is a, there are so many management principles in this so it is a good learning for the generations to learn so but it has to be uni universally done in the academic institutions for somebody to learn and having said that i also would like to add one point to what mr uh, uh, abhay has mentioned in addition to the uh, case studies which need to be really documented we need to look at each case, case study has a different background and different complexities and challenges in different states in different cultural settings we need to bring in what is that complexity or challenge that is there uh, attached to that particular case study and how it could be broken so that is one point which i wanted to say and the second is what mr ayer has mentioned in his book and also the way the journey has taken place it could be even converted as a conceptual framework how one could address that issue so and once that con conceptual framework is made and what i would like to request mr ayer is now there are so many issues in india there are so many social issues which could be when as, uh, the sanitation or use of toilet could be uh, solved i think anything can be solved in india if we have the determination and will so can would you like to take so, suppose had you been asked by someone policy maker or somebody would you like to make such conceptual frameworks for all the social problems or at least some of the social problems that we are facing right now i would like to quote one now in the covid scenario after the wave one after the wave two and the kind of people's behavior on the practice of the covid appropriate behaviors and why government has to enforce legislations or the disciplinary actions against this people should have that behavior change so how we can break this so maybe that could be one of the issues so like this there are so many social issues would you like to take up such development of these kinds of workable doable viable strategies are the conceptual frameworks for this my the second is very simple one you have almost you have engaged yourself in different things not only the work and the personal front also you were almost you are in many things and you can talk versatility on many of these issues and you also maintained that work life balance spending time with family guiding the children and so many things we could see so how you could manage all these within the limited time and extensively traveling across the world so we would like to hear from you on this over thank you namrata do you want me to take a crack at uh, addressing some of these you know, yes questions? please and i think the floor also needs to be opened uh, so sure. yeah if you could take a crack at it so let me let me just very quickly respond because i think a lot of the uh, the questions and comments you know speak for themselves and uh, i think they're very very pertinent but just coming quickly to jenti's uh, you know the couple of points she mentioned first uh you know energy jenti herself is now uh, you know i mean always was she's been a fitness fiend herself uh, you know i think just keeping fit and uh being interested in sort of sports but it it gives you a lot of energy and i think it's quite important as jenti said because these programs you know they don't last for a day or a week or a month or a year over time it's quite important you know it, it's a bit of a truism it's a cliche you just got to be physically fit to keep up that level of 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 work and if you're working 14 15 hour shifts like all of us have done you know everyone in in this call uh, you just, you know it's it's quite obvious that you need to be physically fit to just continue with that work and so uh, i think for me it just became a habit i used to play tennis myself and you know my dad whom jenti has met is uh, a bit crazy himself he's 91 years old he runs 8 10 kilometers a day so he inspired all of us 
I think it's quite important. And I think there's no excuse for not finding the time. I've heard so many people say, I'm so busy, I just don't have the time. But you know, whether you have a treadmill at home or you run outside or you bike, you could be doing anything or swim. I think that's quite important. And you know, that's one of the, the pro tips in my book. Uh, I think Jayanti's second point of, of you know, getting motivating youngsters is critical. You know, in any program, wherever you are, it's the, it's the youngsters who have got the ideas, you know, and the energy, the creativity, the innovation. And so we tried to harness that. And, you know, Jayanti did that, as she mentioned, whether it was interns from IMA, or whether it was young, the Swaj Bharat products from the Tata Trust, uh, it became very, very important, both at the central level in the, in, the, in the ministry, but particularly on the ground. Right? And we had youngsters from IIM, from IITs, and many of them had different reasons for coming up. One of them said, I just want to hang out with a collector. I want to see what do collectors do. And so I think that became very, very important. And they were leading this program. So involving youth became critical. In terms of sort of work-life balance, and I think Lakshmi has referred to that as well. The, you know, that for me was quite important. I think it's important for all of us. And I still remember uh, reading Akio Morita's book, the guy who uh, sort of started Sony. And when someone asked him when he retired, what was the biggest regret in your career? And he said what many people say, you know, I didn't spend enough time with the family. And you hear so many people saying, I gave up my job to spend more time with the family. And I think you need to do that throughout. And it's great fun as well, right? That, the fun element in the job is critical. So I took two years off. I traveled with my daughter, Tara, all over the place. And I just enjoyed it. And uh, many people think if they take a break from their work, you know, what's going to happen to my career? You know, other people will overtake me. I don't think it makes a difference. I mean, it, it all works out in the end. Coming to Abhay's points, you know, champ, spot on. Why can't we replicate? Why are these, you know, isolated stories not being scaled up? I think, that, look, there are many reasons for that. We all work in a political cycle. There's a five-year time frame. People get transferred. There are many. There's no institutional incentive to replicate and to share knowledge. And we tried to do that in Swat Bharat, as uh, Jayanti and I mentioned, where we would get collectors to share experiences, case studies, uh, de facto, or what they did well. So someone, whether it was Arti Dogra, the young collector of Bikane in Rajasthan, who made it the state ODF before I joined. So we got Arti to talk about it with a bunch of 70 collectors in a workshop in Udaipur. So I think our role in government is to facilitate, to share knowledge, and we have the platform to do that. Now, why isn't it happening? I think a couple of reasons. One reason, frankly, is it's quite important at all levels. I've always believed, look, in the private sector, you guys do it all the time, right? You take great care in selecting the right person for the right job at the right time. And I think that incentive is not so much there in government as we all know. And sometimes the right person gets into the right job at the right time, but it's not by, it, it, it's more by accident than by design. So I think one critical area is, and I think this is increasing now, it's also bringing in the right people from outside and there's big debate on lateral entry and so on. And to be honest, I think that, you know, the reason why we perhaps were successful was not so much because I was a, a domain expert in water and sanitation. But because I was from the civil service and I had the networks, the knowledge of government systems, I could pick up the phone, talk to Jayanti. You know, Jayanti, you know, is different. She may well have spoken to a secretary who is from, not from the IAS, but many chief secretaries wouldn't have even picked up the phone. So I think it's, uh, it's important, but still to bring in some level to select the right person and to incentivize the sharing of knowledge. It's not happening. Uh, but uh, I think if you, uh, if you focus on getting the right person, even if it's for a short time, there's no guarantee of tenure, that person will, will make sure that the knowledge, because unless you spread the knowledge, you can't achieve your task. So there's an incentive to connect people. Now coming to case studies, I think Masuri has changed a lot of it. I've, I've been there many times now. I spoke to them fairly recently, a couple of months ago. And increasingly, they're bringing in the case study method. And you know, we can open up that whole debate is probably not the right time where you, the training in the academy, uh, look, it, it can only be limited, right? You can only pretty much train people. You try to for the first 10, 15 years, but 
also expose them to the wider sort of public policy context. And after that 10 to 15 years, like yourself, either you leave and you get into a specialized area, but uh, Jayanti referred to us being generalists. So I totally agree. I think we are specialists in district administration and development. And then after that, we kind of flounder a little bit. You know, we go from job to job and we pick up a little bit here and there. And maybe that's one model which Anil, our batchmate, believes is the right model. I believe that after 10 to 15 years, we need to get into some broad domain area. And I think that is going to help because then you become a specialist. You are interested in that sector. You want to achieve results. Finally, let me just say on this point, you need to have a strong level of political support for all this to happen, right? And if you're given a relatively free hand with a high level of political mandate, then you can achieve a lot of things. And I think that is becoming a challenge everywhere. And it, it uh, you know, it's a problem which is very difficult to solve in these turnovers of people. So you will have a lot of stories. You will have uh, the Ralegaon Siddhi story, et cetera. But uh, it's still going to be a challenge to do that at scale. I think government has the mandate. I think it's improving. And lastly, uh, I think just to very quickly respond to what Lakshmi said, I think these frameworks of Swaj Bharat and all the other experiences should be applied in many other social sector areas. COVID, Mijayanti led the fight against COVID in Gujarat. And many of these principles of behavior change, you know, whether it's wearing a mask or washing your hands with soap or just getting people to change their behavior generally into safer behavior, they should all be applied. The problem is that behavior change as a science and practice has not been mainstreamed into government programs. The focus is more on infrastructure, on brick and mortar. So what you might call the softer elements, uh, I had the you know, opportunity to meet the big boss uh, in, uh, in Delhi in April. And so in fact, he wanted a note on how do you mainstream behavior change, whether it's into COVID or climate change or water conservation, you mentioned, uh, or in you know, plastic waste management, it, the problem is that behavior change is on the fringes of our programs. And unless they are mainstream and made a part of whatever we do, it's going to be difficult to sustain any outcome we achieve. So I think, uh, Lakshmi, you're spot on. This needs to be done. And of course, as you said, uh, you know, I've already spoken about the work life. Let me stop there. I've spoken again for too much, but maybe there are others who would like to come. Thank you. Thank you, Param. Uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Kailash Gupta now to ask you a question. He's been waiting very patiently, and he also happens to be a 1971 IMA alum. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Namaste to everybody. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, we learn more by uh, learning from the failures, uh, stories about the failures. That is the premises. Uh, but generally, we praise people who are successful and Another point is people who fail, they don't want to talk about that failures. So I am an outlier from <laughs> many respects. So Abheji asked, uh, wanted to write some stories. And Lakshmiji asked uh, to Paramji a very pointed question, which very I very much like, that if you did not have a political support, what would you have done? So I am replying to two of those points. I'm PGP, as, as Namtaji told, I'm PGP 1971. In, 19, in 2013, I did PhD from University of North Texas in disaster management and disaster professional. And I, that time I came to know about the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Vigilant Cities project. So I approached the Jaipur mayor uh, uh, proactively and pro bono that I prepared the application to submit for Jaipur and uh, mayor supported. But uh, we did not got in first and second term, 2013, 14, 2015. I again, new mayor was there who even told what is the need, but somehow I persuaded and we got, and Jaipur was selected as one of the hundred resilient cities. And afterwards, uh, you know, some agreement has to be signed. So the municipal commissioner, uh, I told him today is the deadline. He said, oh, IS officer, Are deadline kya hoti hai? Deadline aati hai, chart chali aati hai kya hai? So that, then I went and met the chief secretary and uh, he telephoned and somehow that day, uh, you know, that was signed. But afterwards, there are other things to be done and nobody was taking interest. So I, I met the chief minister, deputy chief minister, secretaries, number of times, three, four years. 
full time i spend my time energy and effort but uh, only surat uh, chennai and uh, pune they have done pune and jaipur got selected together and pune had moved so we lost the opportunity so this is a good case abhiji if he is listening to write a case and namrata ji uh, to write a case study and uh, so that the people can learn you know and i am open i am willing to share um, uh, the whole thing and and that i can name uh, i mean uh, to for the next generation to learn thank you very much namaste thanks for giving me opportunity thank you thank you dr uh, dr kalash um, i mean i completely agree i think so much of our public policy or public management education still needs to get professionalized and that is where i think uh, you know this newly established school uh, the jsw school of public policy at ima is you know is going to play a key role so in the future you know i would be drawing upon all of your experiences and your expertise uh, in making sure that we get the public policy training right uh, the floor is now open so if any one of you has questions you can either put it in the chat box or just raise your hands and then speak namrata while we wait let me just quickly comment on a great point made sure. by mr kalash and uh, i'm sure jayanti and abhay would agree you actually learn more from a loss and from a failure than a success no question and you know the example i would give is of my kids tennis career uh, you know after a, a, a match where they would win you win a match close or not everyone is on a high right so when you are in the car driving home or driving back to your hotel there's really not much to discuss but the most receptive audience i've ever got from my daughter tara and my son mankar when they lost a match so in that's when they're a little chastened they're open to suggestions and you have a half an hour window at the right time in the book which i learned because if you do it immediately after a match sometimes you know they're very very disappointed but at the right time you have a window where you can say listen you lost that game because you didn't go up to the net often enough or your first serve percentage was low too many unforced errors you didn't attack and so they are more receptive and they are more open to learning when they have lost than when they have won there's no question about that and that applies across the board thank you param uh, there is a question by ayush uh i mean you can if you can see the chat box i have any academic research papers ever been published to frame public policies uh you could respond to that and even i have a very brief response to that but i'll come to it later sure i think you might be much better place to respond in terms of uh the swachh bharat mission itself there have been a number of external evaluations right and that was one thing we were quite keen upon whether it was done by unicef or the world health organization or the london school of economics wotton did a case study uh, each one focused on slightly different aspects but uh, for example the issue of leadership in in programs such as this uh, th- there was an issue of uh, disruption right did we go out and disrupt the system which i think to some extent we did so i think from public policy perspective there have been a, a, there's been a little bit of research i think a lot more is going on and i think unfortunately a lot of it is focused on they've got a bit side track on has india really become odf and you know i think it's dynamic you know if you are, if you ask me are there people still defecating in the open i would say yes right it's an ongoing effort there are people who have come in later etc so i think the debate has shifted there but it should shift it should focus probably a little bit more on the questions which all of us are discussing how do you deliver large scale programs how do you replicate how do you scale up i think those are the challenging questions hopefully namrata your institute can take up but maybe you have something to say <laughs> yes i think uh, you know a sir, lot a reason, lot uh, sorry to sorry to sorry, interrupt sir i would uh, this is ayush uh, yes person who asked this question sir if i may uh, just clarify the question so the reason why i asked is uh, for the same uh, reason that whether uh, there has been an inspiration taken from the academics by the practitioners in services uh, referring to the uh, research output of the country to frame any public policy has mm-hmm. there been an inspiration so uh, quite specifically <laughs> ayush uh, just to quickly respond i mean i can give you the the 10 second answer yes absolutely so in the swachh bharat mission a lot of the work we did on behavior change was inspired by 
a common friend of Jay Jayanti and I share, Professor Val Curtis, the late Curtis, who was a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who had uh, worked extensively and researched extensively on what are the real triggers of behavior change, right? Are they disgust? Are they love? Are they pride? Uh, and so how can you trigger behavior change? We put many of those principles into practice. What perhaps had never been done was scale, right? So how do you do that at scale? But a lot of the evidence about the triggers of behavior change in sanitation in particular came out of research and the academic work done by Val Curtis and many others. Thank you, Param. Uh, I mean, I had a similar response. Yes, a lot of uh, policy practice is inspired by academic research. So besides the broader theoretical frameworks, there is now an entire field that does uh, randomized control trials on uh, policy intervention. So piloting policies before they are scaled up. So yes, there is a lot going on in terms of uh, exchange of ideas between academia and policy practice. So I'll uh, you know, just uh, stick to that brief response. And uh, Mukesh, who is a colleague here, Professor Mukesh Sood is waiting uh, to ask you a question, Param. Uh, hi, Param, and thanks, Namrata, for uh, giving me this chance. Uh, Param, fantastic job. I think everybody has been talking highly about it, and it's very impressive. Um, again, I'm going to be uh, talking, uh, I want you to react to something similar to what the previous questioner had in terms of academic support, because a lot of what Sunstein and Taylor did on Nudge, uh, you have talked about that. Now, I would like you to elaborate a little bit about how you really nudged people to achieve your end objective, and whether that can add to the academic research in nudge theory? Yeah, no, uh, great question, Mukesh. Uh, so as I mentioned in the book, you know, and uh, Sunstein, by the way, now is, you know, he's joined the Democratic Administration, he's an advisor in the, in the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm in touch with Cass here. A couple of things, we, you know, he uh, sort of brought home to us when he came to India, was if you really want to sustain a program, you need to stick at it for three to five years. You know, he spoke about uh, the wearing of seat belts in America. It took people 20, 30 years, he said, to really internalize it and, you know, and not to have it imposed from above. So what, uh, in terms of putting that into practice, how do you convince, how do you nudge people? It was frankly uh, a little bit of carrot and stick, uh, to be absolutely honest. So, you know, while you might call carrot nudge, Stick was not exactly what Taylor and Sunstein spoke about. But what we learned was that when you're working in a federal setup and you've got some state governments which have different political parties running the state, you know, it's quite challenging. So what are the different tools in your arsenal which you can deploy to change behavior? And so we had to do it at different levels. I think that was one of the first things. First of all, we had to change behavior within ourselves in the ministry in the government of India. We had to work with key stakeholders before we got down to the actual behavior change in a village where people would change their behavior of defecating in the open. It was important to get others to change their behavior, chief ministers, chief secretaries, collectors. And so we had to first have to work at multiple levels. The second was different techniques and tactics had to be used for different situations. For example, in Orissa, you know, just to be very blunt, there was very little political traction. The chief minister wasn't interested because he thought that you know, this program would give the central government and the prime minister more political mileage than they would get in Orissa. So they never took sanitation seriously. Bengal was different. Bengal was very interesting. I met the chief minister and she told me very bluntly, she said, Mr. Secretary, uh, you know, we are very interested in sanitation. In many ways, as you know, Mukesh, sanitation was really developed extensively in Midnapur by the Ramakrishna Mission. Bangladesh learned all their sanitation from them. She said, we're going to do it, but we're going to call it Nirmal Bangla. We're not going to call it Swat Bharat. And when I mentioned that to the Prime Minister, he was very amused in those early days. And he said, okay, as long as they're getting it done, how does it matter? And then, we had, so in Orissa, we worked with the, the civil servants and NGOs, because we weren't getting traction from above. But in the end, I think, you know, as I learned in my OB uh, classes in my MBA, which I did at the NBI, incidentally taught by many IIMA faculty, including Professor Gaz Gupta, who taught us micro, 
in those days. Uh, one thing we learned was you have to incentive incentives are very different, and every person has got a different trigger. And so, uh, but some triggers are common. The the emotion of pride, I think, was overwhelmingly uh, important for us, particularly for women and girls. So in UP, Izzat Ghar became a big thing. Women and girls who you know have to hold it in, have to go out in the dark. For them, it was a huge thing, and they we started marketing the symbol of a house of pride. A toilet is a house of pride. And I think lastly, we also incentivize and nudge people into good behavior by personal example. So Jayanti was with me when we entered toilet pits to clean them out in Varangal in early 2017. So a, a twin pit toilet is safe. When one pit is closed, you can get in, take it out with your hand, and use it as compost. So I think there was a, a there were many tools in our arsenal which we deployed. The challenge was always scale. and as abhay said one size never fits all it had to be adapted to the local context but it was constant motivating incentivizing recognizing celebrating communicating uh, across the board and it had to be done over a period of time you couldn't stop off but so we had to keep at it repeatedly uh, uh you know to just get that behavior change and then to sustain it so i don't know if i answered your question but i think it was a, a continual effort and as lakshmi said there was never any mission accomplished 2nd october 2019 was a big milestone the prime minister was with us in amdavad we were celebrating how the country declared itself odf and then we knew that it was never really going to be perfect always and we had to keep at it thank you param uh, there's just a comment from uh, another colleague here professor sundravalli who also says in kerala also they have a local uh, name for it which is equivalent to symbol of pride um so we have maybe time for one last brief question and then we will wrap up uh, the discussion okay. how is delhi's response is uh, professor sundravalli's uh, question no, delhi's response is great in fact the pm asked me a couple of times and i had to uh, confess my ignorance the first time he said yeah is that girl ko uh, you know other languages mein kya bolte hain so finally in our one of our final events we translated izzat gar into all the 22 languages and we stuck it up on a toilet in haryana and kurukshetra in early 2019 so then he was satisfied he said you know we need to translate this into other languages okay so i'll just add an amusing anecdote because i've been following this very closely param and this forms a substantial part of the chapter in a book i'm writing they used gandhi giri where they had people standing there with flowers and <laughs> offering a flower and i got a picture of that in our chapter so they did very some very amusing things and uh, which is what made it so successful yeah no gandhi giri spot on okay that's exactly what shukla ji taught jayanti and me my old advisor from my bijnor days where you hold out a flower you uh, the, the nigrani samiti goes out in the morning and you don't shame people but you know you you practice gandhi giri so gandhi was a very very powerful symbol you know as we uh, were in porbandar in that odia declaration the symbolism of the program was huge and you know we haven't spoken about that but the prime minister was spot on you know uh, let me just tell you that very briefly how the symbol of gandhi ji's chashma was selected so before i join the pm was very clear we needed to have a very potent iconic symbol for the program and a tag line so the, so he said let's put it out in the public domain because we are not expert let's see what the public says so we got something in the ministry like 5000 responses you know all kinds of design symbols and tag lines so the ministry before i joined they selected the top 50 symbols and the top 50 tag lines and sent it off to the pm and after a week the pmo called the secretary and said listen we reject all your 50 things you guys don't know send us all 5000 <laughs> so all 5000 were sent to the pmo and then hey presto after a month emerged pm personally pulled out the chashma which was uh, sent by someone the tag line of ek kadam swachhata ki or from someone else put them together 
and that became the symbol of the program the the, the glasses and the tagline very 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 powerful and you know evoking gandhi ji who was a champion of sanitation also made a very big difference thank you param for sharing that so now i think we have come uh, to the end of our time here um i guess i don't have enough words to thank you all for such a thought provoking discussion and for all the participants who asked uh, such interesting uh, questions that kept the debate and the discussions alive here so a big thank you from the jsw school of public policy here at the indian institute of management amdabad once again and for everyone uh, especially param and the panelists uh, once again wishing you all you know wherever you are a nice evening and a nice day ahead thank you thank you navrata and thank to the institute you. and to all of the panel great to catch up with jayanti abhay and lakshmi and uh, very nice to interact with <coughs> all of you and look forward to catching up soon thank you very much sure we all look nice. forward thank to hosting you, you param here in person very soon bye bye thank you hey, and hope to catch up with you soon